Hello everyone, my name is Karina Angel and I'm here with Michael St. John and Sigi Volkoff from the Red Hat Storage uh, Business Unit as well as Yana Wong from IBM and we're here to talk about IBM DB2 Warehouse on OpenShift Container Storage. So really excited about the performance tests that they've been doing on OCP and please Michael take it away. Thanks a lot Karina. Yeah, so today we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, I'll give a little introduction to DB2 with Red Hat uh, OpenShift, and uh, then I'm going to turn it over to Sagi and Yana to talk a little bit more about the testing that was done and the performance results. So let's uh, go ahead and get started here. If, um, if you're not familiar with DB2, well, I think you should be, <laughs> because uh, DB2 is actually one of the uh, industry's leading database platforms. A uh, lot of very critical workloads uh, run on on DB2, um, as well as being able to be deployed in multiple different ways. So think about it from an OLTP perspective. Let's say you have cloud native developers that are developing uh, applications that need a, a, a relational database. Uh, DB2 is, is a great piece for that. And then as well, DB2 can be used as a data warehouse, symmetrical multiprocessing type deployment, as well as a multiple parallel processing deployment. Uh, they also have Event Store, which is a uh, in-memory database, uh, can be deployed on the cloud or through Cloud Pack for Data. Um, so for our testing, we looked at DB2 Warehouse. DB2 Warehouse uh, includes a built-in machine learning, uh, as I mentioned, both SMP and MPP processing, and in database analytics uh, con combined with this IBM VLU acceleration. Uh, what we did here was we used DB2 Warehouse um, multi-parallel processing uh, for our tests, and you know, typically as we look at that, we have a, a lot of customers who are looking at uh, business uh, intelligence type workloads, AI, ML type workloads. And so uh, we wanted to focus in on that, but as well, you know, we felt that uh, the DB2 Warehouse MPP uh, tests would give us a, a good indication because they're very complex workloads. We thought that it, it would give us a good indication of how well uh, DB2 works in an OpenShift environment with OpenShift Container Storage. Uh, and then as well, you know, we're, uh, we're looking at this from a hybrid data warehouse perspective. So you're, you're able to do rapid data retrieval and you have flexible deployment and scalability regardless of how you're deploying that, uh, that implementation. So as you look at why people are, you know, considering running DB2, because typically you think about uh, some of these databases running in a uh, traditional on-prem type of environment, why are people looking to modernize their, their, uh, their data infrastructure and move DB2 to more of a containerized uh, development environment? Well, if you look typically right now in the industry, about 71% uh, or more of organizations are planning to containerize existing applications. And so for the past few years, IBM has been uh, doing a lot of work to make sure all of their software applications are running in a new modern containerized environment. And you see this a lot with customers who are trying to uh, modernize and, and go cloud native with their application development, application deployment, and now a lot of those machine learning and data intelligence types of applications. So why is DB2 as a cloud native database important? Well, first of all, we have the ability to do very rapid deployment. Uh, if you think about, and, and if you're familiar with OpenShift and the OpenShift operator, you're able to, to deploy uh, your applications much faster. With a DB2 operator, you're able to do a very quick deployment to a, uh, a worker node. Uh, you have simplified lifecycle management, so as you know, in your day two operations, as uh, new uh, application versions come out, it can be automatically uh, updated. Uh, so you have a, a much easier uh, update process. 
uh, which gives you, if you see in the middle and the bottom, faster delivery of new features. And then DB2 services can be deployed as microservices. And as I mentioned, these day two uh, operations, they can be developed, they can be spun up, uh, they can be updated and scaled independently, right? And then we have the, that flexibility that I alluded to for, you know, on-prem or uh, across private clouds, public cloud type of um, deployments. So what are some of the key benefits? I mean, typically if you're looking at uh, like an OpenShift containerized type platform, uh, this reigns true with uh, delivering your uh, DB2 environment as well. It's, you know, it's all around agility. So being able to deploy DB2 uh, when you need it, where you need it. So one of the key benefits now is that your, uh, your data scientists or application developers don't need to go back to an administrator to get resources for their projects. They can spin up projects very quickly, very easily. They can spin up sandbox type of environments. If, uh, if they don't like something, they can just trash it and it all gets done uh, automatically within the, uh, the uh, Kubernetes infrastructure. So this is a, a great uh, deployment strategy for people who want to take advantage of DB2. And then from a scalability perspective, running on OpenShift container storage, we saw, we see, and we'll show you in, in some of the testing that we did, that we meet or exceed resource utilization, scalability, and performance expectations across the board. And then it's also about reducing the complexity. So with OpenShift container storage, we provide the data services that are provisioned just like you would provision the compute resources for the DB2 application. And it's all done within one unified control plane. Uh, so what is some of the technical differentiation that we see? Well, you know, by doing a lot of the testing uh, internally with IBM, we have a validated solution. So you can trust in the reliability and the performance uh, of the environment. So, you know, as you, as you look, for example, uh, IBM has done a lot of testing uh, around these solutions with, uh, with other storage environments. So they have a good idea of what works, what doesn't work, what performs well. Uh, this is why we're coming to you today. We want to tell you about the great performance and, uh, and the exceptional uh, deployment uh, experience that we had, right? And then from a security perspective, there's a lot of security already built into IBM DB2, uh, but also by using OpenShift and OpenShift container storage, we have very strict standards for security. So you have a very secure storage layer for DB2 uh, across that entire environment. And then from a lifecycle management perspective, I already kind of talked a little bit about this, but uh, OpenShift container storage is designed and tightly integrated in with Red Hat OpenShift. So you have a, a consistency across your user experience in that type of environment, and you're able to manage your compute resources for the application, in this case, DB2, as well as your storage layer uh, independently. That brings us to the next point here, being able to independently scale your database resources or your application resources from your storage performance. And then what does it mean to you typically. So if you take a look at it from a, uh, a big data or uh, analytics AIML um, director's perspective, uh, you know, running IBM DB2 on Red Hat OpenShift Container Storage gives a, a big data director the ability to scale storage as their needs increase with reliability and performance and the ability to utilize uh, Red Hat OpenShift to run both DB2 and the storage that supports it makes operations more efficient and better utilizes uh, existing IT skills that you might have uh, already uh, in your IT department. Right? From a data architect or data engineer perspective, uh, think about uh, OpenShift and OpenShift container storage providing more of a modern data architecture that's based on containers and, and the Kubernetes orchestration. The whole platform can be configured to be highly resilient and it, it can scale without arbitrary, uh, arbitrary limitations, right? So data can be hosted redundantly 
across multiple geographically distributed uh, availability zones or failover zones to provide business continuity and a rapid disaster recovery for that type of environment. And then from a data scientist perspective, supporting IBM DB2 on OpenShift container storage empowers the data scientists to in innovate without artificial constraints or without constraints placed on it by the storage administrator. So with Kubernetes operators, data scientists can work entirely within Red Hat OpenShift to program their infrastructure for both the DB2 application and Red Hat OpenShift container storage so they can focus on innovating, focus on their solutions, and, uh, and not worry about the underlying infrastructure. And uh, here we have a quote from Piotr Mirzajewski. He's uh, the director of DB2 development uh, for IBM Data and Artificial Intelligence. One of the great things about this implementation is with no prior experience with OpenShift container storage, they were able to ramp this up within a, a couple of weeks. So, you know, they actually thought that it was going to take them a lot longer without any prior experience. It took them about a week to set everything up, uh, another week to get everything tuned up and the tests ready. And uh, you'll hear more about that from Yana and uh, Sagi. So I'll pass this on to them to talk a little bit more about the test layout. Thank you, Michael. Let me share. I like how uh, we all look very young in the picture that you put in uh, with the last quote. <laughs> me and Yana are going to talk about the actual testing that was done. I'll concentrate on uh, the layout of the cluster of the OpenShift and OCS mm -hmm. cluster. And uh, Yana will talk about uh, uh, the results. So we have this decided to use uh, the uh, Data Warehouse version of DB2 for a few reasons. First of all, it's designed to do a uh, uh, massive parallel uh, processing of uh, data. So we want something that will hammer our storage, the OpenShift container storage, uh, as much as uh, possible. It's also um, uh, pretty much what uh, IBM usually use when they test a new uh, storage subsystem, the data warehouse uh, version. And uh, the uh, end of this long DB2WHOC means uh, on the cloud. And the reason uh, we decided on, uh, uh, on the cloud was, well, everyone is doing something on the cloud. And also um, uh, it was the uh, in terms of a constraint of what we could use at this uh, point of time, the cloud was uh, easier to do. As you can see in this uh, slide, there's a few calculations that are being done uh, in trying to basically um, match a, a DB2 data warehouse to the cluster uh, that you are uh, uh, running on. Each in the past would run a, a, a partition of the data warehouse, what is called a, a logical node or multiple logical node, an MLN. And um, there's a few calculations that uh, need to be done, minimum of eight gigabyte of RAM per core of whatever you are running. Uh, you can see it uh, uh, all in here. The other uh, part of this equation is that we also looked at the OpenShift uh, best practices and uh, it says, uh, leave two CPUs per node and eight gigabyte, uh, eight gigabyte of RAM per node for OpenShift. The rest you can use for uh, your application. So with that in, uh, in mind, um, as I said, we decided on a, a, a AWS. Um, this is a, um, a seven node a OpenShift 4.3 cluster. Um, it's seven because there's only uh, uh, one master. Don't uh, try this in uh, production, but for a budget perspective, it's, uh, it's uh, easier. Um, we decided to use four uh, nodes uh, of uh, uh, R5A uh, 4X uh, for the worker nodes that are going to run the DB2 pods or the uh, MLNs. Um, and these, these, um, these nodes are, are known to have a very good uh, uh, ratio in communication uh, um, uh, bandwidth between 
the cores and the memory. These are uh, AMD uh, uh, nodes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we are using uh, three uh, instances that are of the, uh, I think AWS called them a uh, storage in instances, uh, I3 and 2X. Um, these are basically um, a, an AWS instance that has directly attached to it, or supposedly directly attached to it, uh, to uh, uh, NVMe devices, to 2.3 terabyte NVMe devices. So our uh, OpenShift uh, uh, container storage cluster is basically formed out of these three nodes. Each of them has two storage devices, gives us a total of uh, six devices. Um, and we uh, ran our initial uh, uh, test on uh, everything on a, a single zone. Um, so doing all of this uh, calculation of how much we need to keep on the, let's call them the uh, DB2 worker uh, nodes, how much we need to keep for uh, OpenShift, uh, basically um, gives us this amount of uh, uh, requirements that was used for each of the MLNs or the DB2 uh, partition uh, pods and uh, the total of uh, the DB2 uh, capacity, uh, four DB2 compute nodes, four MLN, 52 CPUs, and 416 gigabyte of RAM. Um, this is how it looks um, basically in a, in a nice, uh, uh, nicer diagram. Um, on the top, the four uh, OpenShift uh, nodes that are going to run DB2. On the bottom, the three uh, OpenShift container storage nodes that are going to provide the storage and our uh, single master on the side. Um, for, uh, for the setup itself, uh, we basically uh, needed uh, what uh, I guess in the DB2 world is called uh, a storage zone, two types of uh, storage zone. One is a shared uh, storage zone. Uh, this uh, shared storage zone uh, has a, 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 is using a, a CephFS. Uh, Ceph is one of the, uh, is the building blocks of uh, OpenShift container storage. Um, and um, portion of uh, CephFS is, uh, or directly is used to share information between the partitions of the DB2 uh, pods or the instances of DB2 that are running on uh, different nodes. Also, uh, the test uh, data was uh, created and stored on, um, uh, on a CephFS uh, directory in order to create once and then upload using external table into uh, uh, all the database uh, pods. And then we have also um, a, a, a zone or storage zone that is not shared, that is pair database uh, instance or pair database pod. And this is using uh, uh, Ceph uh, RBD, the block device option of uh, uh, Ceph. Um, as stated, this, this zone needs um, um, very high performance uh, uh, storage. And so that's why uh, we chose uh, uh, Ceph RBD for that. Um, this is a little bit of a how DB2 looks in the Kubernetes slash OpenShift world. Um, uh, um, DB2 is installed as a, a, or the DB2 MLNs are installed as a, a stateful sets. Uh, there's a, um, a, an, a, another version of a, a, you know, ETCD that runs as a stateful set and uh, basically to uh, track information and heartbeat between the different partitions or the different IB DB2 uh, pods. Um, there's uh, uh, other pods that are running in the background, some from uh, a management, some as a toolbox, but um, uh, the, the, the two uh, most important one are the two at the top. Um, from the OpenShift container storage uh, uh, layout or configuration, um, when we ran this, uh, we were still running version 4.3. Um, as I said, uh, we used um, um, those NVMe devices um, that the, the AWS instance uh, provided um, what you, via what we call direct attach storage. We're using the uh, uh, local storage operator to basically hand out 
uh, these uh, uh, NVMe devices or uh, as, uh, uh, as PVs, and then OpenShift container storage in return use those as the building blocks for their Ceph cluster and then provide uh, the storage uh, from uh, there. Because the, uh, the nodes that we use, uh, we want to keep it as uh, uh, um, cheap as possible. Or um, we, uh, I had to tweak a little bit uh, the CPUs that I gave to other components of a, a OpenShift container storage, because we are mainly going to use um, a little bit of CephFS and mostly of a, a RBD slash block. So you have uh, the resources that I kind of uh, uh, limited. Um, which basically, in future versions, we might uh, have the ability to even control this uh, dynamically, the resources for pair different uh, uh, components of uh, OpenShift container storage, which will basically mean that we will be able to provide even more performance or more resources just to the RBD portion, uh, allowing a DB2 to uh, get even more performance from the same uh, layout. Just another uh, quick uh, uh, diagram of how OpenShift container storage basically looks. Those up in the top are basically our, excuse me, our DB2 uh, pods uh, that are uh, running in, in uh, some nodes. Um, uh, the, red, the OpenShift container storage uh, uh, pods, we have um, uh, several of them. Those many OSDs that you are seeing are basically a pod that gets attached into a storage device that the Ceph cluster will use. So in our case, we had six NVMEs, we had six OSDs. Um, the MONs uh, uh, look up on, uh, uh, on these OSDs, on uh, the metadata on them, uh, provide information on where to read and, and uh, when from. Um, and there's other pods uh, 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 that are also a part of the OpenShift container storage. And with that, I will move this uh, to Yana. All right, let's take a look at performance. So when we looked at performance, we basically wanted to answer four basic questions. One is uh, how well does DB2 on Red Hat OpenShift container storage perform in general? How well are we utilizing our system resources? Uh, how well does the system scale as we increase the size of our workload? And how do we compare to existing cloud-based storage solutions for DB2? Those are the four questions we were going after. Um, in order to answer these questions and to test the performance, we utilized a workload that's called BDI. I would like to give a little background on what this workload represents. Uh, to show that it is really relevant as a typical data warehouse application. BDI stands for Big Data Intelligence. It is an IBM-defined workload, um, and it basically models the life in a business intelligence application where we have a retail database with in-store, online, and catalog sales of merchandises. Um, the schema of this BDI workload follows that of the TPCDS benchmark specification, so our standard industry benchmark, and that comes with seven pack tables, um, like store sales and store returns, catalog sales, catalog returns, wrap sales, wrap returns, and an inventory table, in addition to 17 dimension tables where we store information about the customer data, about the items, about the products, and so on. Um, interesting with this workload or what we can do is we can generate this database at any scale factor. And in order to analyze the performance of DB2 with Red Hat OpenShift container storage, we used a one terabyte workload with scale factor 1000 basically, which means we work with about one terabyte of raw data or flat files. Um, in order to also see how well the system scales, we also set up a two terabyte DDI workload to see what happens if we increase the size of the data by 2x, how does performance change. Um, now to the query side, so the workload is a query only workload. It comes with 100 queries that were inspired by Cognos 10 generated SQL for dashboards and reports. And we basically have three types of users that are represented 
with this workload. Uh, for one, we have the returns dashboard analyst. So that's a person that would investigate the rate of return, the impact on the bottom line of the business. Um, these users run typically very simple queries that can be answered in sub-seconds. And 70 out of our 100 workload queries fall into this category and we consider them simple queries. The second user that is represented is like a sales report analyst. Um, he would generate sales reports um, to understand the profitability of the retail enterprise. These users run more intermediate queries with like runtime of up to one minute. And 25 out of our 100 workload queries fall into this category and they call, we call them intermediate queries. And then we have a third user that's the deep dive analyst, so the data scientists. And they use handcrafted deep dive analysis to answer questions um, identified by both the returns dashboard analyst and the sales report analyst. And, you know, these are very complex queries with several minutes of runtime, and we have five of those very complex queries. Um, now we have two different ways we can run the workload, and we utilize both of those during our, um, you know, during our testing. For one, it's the serial mode, where we have a single user that basically runs through all 100 queries from beginning to end, and we measure, like, how long does it take on this particular system to finish running all 100 queries. Um, then there's a second mode that we can run in, that's the concurrent or the throughput test mode, where we uh, have a given number of users, in our case we use 16 and 32 concurrent users, that submit um, a number of queries or an unending amount of queries um, of a certain category to the workload or to the database for a period of, in our case, one hour. So we want to see how much work can be can get done within a one hour time frame. Um, the queries we chose are only intermediate and heavy queries, not the simple ones, because obviously those can screw the picture of the throughput quite a bit. So we're looking at uh, to kind of stress test the system by <clears throat> allowing 16 or 30 concurrent users to just uh, put intermediate and heavy queries against the database for a period of one hour and we get a throughput of queries per hour. So uh, to summarize what we did for our runs, uh, both on the one terabyte and the two terabyte setup, we did a serial warm-up run. So on a cold buffer pool to see just run all 100 queries. We did a serial three iteration run where we run each query three times, measure the total elapsed time for that. And then we have two concurrent or throughput tests with 16 heavy users and with 32 heavy user again means we're using intermediate and complex queries only. All right, so can move to the next slide. Uh, one more, that's right. Um, so here on this graph, you can see the overall performance summary. What we here see is on the left, we're looking at warm up and serial run performance. So the bars in blue represent the results for the one terabyte setup, the bars in purple for the two terabyte setup. And again, we're measuring the elapsed time. How long does it take to run all 100 queries? So the warm-up run for one terabyte took 3.8 minutes. Uh, the three iteration serial, 10.87 minutes. Um, for the two terabyte, the warm-up was 7.7 .7 minutes. So about uh, 2x um, the time of the one terabyte workload, which we would expect because we doubled the data. And then for the two terabyte serial three iteration runs, we had 22.6 minutes, which also is about two times the amount of the one terabyte three iteration runs. Now on the right graph, we see the results for the multi-user run throughput tests. Important here to note is that we are looking at how, much, how many queries we were able to finish within a one hour time frame. So the higher the bar, the better here versus on the left side, the lower the bar, the better there, because we looked at total time. But now on the right, we're looking at throughput. Here you can see that for the one terabyte, um, 16 user run, as well as 32 user run, the throughput is between 440 and 460 queries per hour. And as we move to the two terabyte runs, the throughput goes down to 252 and 228 queries per hour. What is nice to note here, which we will talk a little bit about a little bit later too, 
as we increase the data size by a factor 2x, the performance only goes down by factor 1.7x. So we don't even see a 2x drop, which means that the system scales pretty well. All right, please move to the next slide. Now, that was just the overall overview, what we just saw. The numbers in itself uh, on one system don't mean that much other than the scalability factor. We need to compare to something and we also need to answer, well, how well does the system utilize its resources? So we took a look at three things, CPU utilization, disk utilization, as well as memory and network utilization. So one of the most important things we often look at is CPU utilization. So we look at, you know, how busy are our CPUs during our runs. We did this for all serial and multi-user runs. We're going to focus here on the multi-user runs because that is more interesting as we look at it. So in this, you see on the top, the top two graphs represent the one terabyte CPU utilization. And here you see uh, the DB2 nodes are averaging about 65% during the 16 heavy multi-user run. So there's still room, uh, you know, we're not totally maxing it out. The OCS node CPU utilization is also fairly low. Um, but as we increase um, our data volume to two terabyte, we see that CPU utilization goes up from that 65% now to 90% for the DB2 nodes. And we also see an increase of CPU utilization on the OCS node side. So this overall shows, you know, we are utilizing our system resources pretty good. Okay, next slide. Um, now let's take a look at disk utilization. So um, again, the top two graphs represent the one terabyte run results uh, or disk utilization on both DB2 node and OCS node. And on the bottom, the two little graphs show the two terabyte runs. Now, I understand that the picture is fairly small, but it, um, it's okay because we only need to kind of see um, what has changed between the upper graphs and the lower graphs. So on the top for the one terabyte runs, you can see um, that we um, have a fairly low disk utilization. Um, I would say maybe around 25% yeah, with a few spikes here and there. Um, one thing to note is that the one terabyte setup occupied about 42% of the available disk space that we had, and almost all the data fit into buffer pool. So we would expect to not see too much disk I.O. because most of the uh, data is in buffer pool and we can rate straight from there. But that changes as we move to the two terabyte run. So when we have set up the two terabyte workload, um, about 85% of this space was now occupied. And we now only fit about 25% of our data into buffer pool, which means we have lots more um, disk IO going on. We need to clean pages from the buffer pool. We re need to read new pages into the buffer pool. And that is very much reflected on these graphs. So if you compare the bottom, left to the top left graph, you can see that we many times reach this busyness of like 100% even, you know, it spikes here and there, but it's definitely much higher. We also see on the right side that on the OCS nodes, we also see the disk, the disk utilization increase. Um, one thing to notice, uh, I think Sagi mentioned that earlier, we have run this on uh, four DB2 nodes and three OCS nodes. Uh, the graph here is re a representation of one of those, but good to note is also that the disk utilization is very similar across all four DB2 nodes and across all three Red Hat OCS nodes. So that's a good sign that there's no imbalance going on. All right, next slide, please. Uh, now let's just take a quick look at memory and network utilization. So they overall appear healthy, that they didn't pre represent any performance bottleneck. Um, we have memory available to the OCS nodes as well as the DB2 nodes, but again, they don't represent any problems. Um, overall, the RAM is utilized as expected. And again, we saw that memory and network utilization is very similar across all four DB2 nodes and all three OCS nodes, which, which shows that 
you know, we don't have any school going on. We, we really have a good balance of how everything is working. Again, it's, I understand the, the picture is very small here, but I'll walk you through it. So the graph in the middle represents the bars. The blue bars show the, um, the run results for the one terabyte setup and the purple ones, the, one, the run results for the two terabyte runs. And you could see that, you know, as we increase or double the amount of data, the throughput um, reduction is only 1.75x, which suggests good scalability. And the reason for that is that during the one terabyte run, we're not running our resources to the max. We saw that CPU utilization was around 60%. As we increase uh, our data, we, we maximize it more to 90 to 100%. We see on the on the data busyness that you know we go we utilize our system resources really well. We are um, reaching often you know 90 to 100 percent disk utilization, and also our OCS nodes show you know this increase. Um, this is pretty significant. We have been testing with other systems as well in the past and have not seen this great of a scalability. This is really good news for us. Um, another thing that I want to mention on this part is also that um, during our four-day test window that we had on the system, the, perform the system performed really well. We had no unexpected outages, so the resiliency seemed very good. So that was a very good thing. Um, now, in order to also evaluate how well, does the compare performance of Red Hat on uh, of DB2 on Red Hat OCS compare to existing cloud-based storage offerings? We have run the same set of tests <clears throat> on different configurations. Um, the one pictured here is one that basically comes closest in terms of number of MLNs, number of CPUs, numbers of RAM um, that we had in comparison to the Red Hat OpenShift container storage. Um, we measured the, um, you know, the same type of test, a one terabyte and two terabyte BDI workload pictured here is the one terabyte output. Um, we would run the warm up and serial runs as well as the throughput runs. Pictured here is the throughput runs, which is again more relevant. Um, and we would in the end normalize it. So the um, cloud-based storage solution had uh, about 50% more RAM so we ended up um, normalizing the numbers. What would it look like if we had about the same number of RAM? The number of cores or CPUs was the same to start with. So when we do that, we can see that we are pretty much on par uh, in those two cases, which suggests you know the performance is as expected. It's doing really well. Sagi, you can yeah. continue from here if you like. This is just a. Uh beginning of a journey between OpenShift uh, Container Storage Platform and uh, DB2. All this data is already in a published uh, uh, white paper, and the next white papers are going to concentrate on uh, our all sort of uh, failover scenarios, um, which from the DB2 customer perspective is um, uh, super, uh, super important. Uh, we're gonna do also uh, some bare metal uh, performance and um, use uh, um, not only data warehouse, but the OTP and all up uh, uh, workloads uh, to test everything. Um, and, then, and, and then also um, IBM uh, Cloud Pack for Data version uh, 3 will have uh, um, support of uh, uh, OpenShift Container Storage uh, 4. And I think that's about it. These are the uh, the people that help us, uh, uh, besides uh, me and Iana and many uh, Loic and Rishi and uh, Peter, and we want to thank uh, them as well. Thank you, all three of you. That was excellent. And we do have some questions. First question is, does DB2 need its own etcd? Yes, from what I understand, it does need its own uh, etcd. It might, in the future, not uh, have to use that, but right now, um, and, and it's a super uh, lightweight uh, in, in terms of uh, resources anyhow, but the, right now DB2 
this is what they use in uh, to share information and mainly status of the partitions uh, uh, between the pods. And another question is, does uh, cloud-based based block storage, um, is that the same as EBS? We could have done this with EBS and that would be mean that for OpenShift container storage as the building block, we would have had to use something like GP2 or IO1, uh, which will uh, um, either make things extremely more expensive or um, probably also extremely more slow in the GP2 case. So I don't know if AWS consider those storage in instances as part of EBS. I don't think so. Uh, this, think of it as an instance that has uh, two storage devices directly attached to it. And OCS uh, with Ceph basically create a cluster uh, from this and manage the storage, uh, protects the data, uh, replicate the data, and all of this. Nice. Yeah, but one one thing I, I might just add is, you know, if you're looking at OpenShift container storage, it gives you the file block and object storage protocols. So you don't have to go to like an EBS. All right, another question. In the layout diagram, you showed that you deployed persistent storage on different nodes other than DB2. Can't I run everything together in OpenShift? You can. Um, this goes actually more on the requirements for DB2. Um, and right now, the requirements are for a DB2 pod to consume all the resources uh, on a particular uh, OpenShift uh, node, minus all the resources that OpenShift uh, needs. Or, uh, um, so this is a DB2 requirement. Um, I'm not a, 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 a DB2 uh, a expert on that end. I don't know if they are going to change it. I think it's more of a reflection of the migration from, you know, bare metal, uh, where these uh, uh, processes of DB2, we just want to consume as much resources as possible on each uh, on each server, moving into the uh, OpenShift world or slash even to the cloud. It's kind of uh, right now continuing with the same um, uh, the same line of thoughts. So. Uh, technically, for, uh, for sure you can do this, um, but right now I think the DB2 requirements are to have the DB2 pod on um, um, consume all the resources on, on each node. All right, another question is, so DB2, you're testing on OpenShift, uh, does this also run in IBM Cloud Pack for Data. Yeah, maybe for those that aren't familiar with the IBM Cloud Pack for Data, uh, you know, it, it's it's one of the ways that you can purchase services for DB2. So, you know, with the Cloud Pack for you, you have a single bu bundle where you you purchase that one bundle, and then you can have multiple IBM applications, and DB2 is is one of them, both the DB2 OL, OLTP and uh, DB2 Warehouse, and and that can all be run within that license, and then they can uh, all run that within the OpenShift environment. And then in addition, there's this IBM storage suite for IBM Cloud Packs that gives you the ability to deploy all your data services, including, it, it does include the Red Hat OpenShift container storage, as well as Red Hat CEP storage uh, for any of the Cloud Pack environments. So uh, so that's an interesting, interesting way of purchasing, you know, overall IBM services for your environment. All right, another question is, which version of OCP, so OpenShift Container Platform, have we tested this performance? Yeah, so this was a uh, OCP, OCS uh, 4.3. Um, the next white paper, the next uh, white paper that's gonna come up on failovers is, will be with uh, 4.4. Okay. Are you 
the 4.5 is coming out shortly. Are you, are there plans to? We might do 4.5, uh, it depends on the OCS side, on the open source container storage yeah, side, but um, it's definitely gonna be 4.4 or something higher. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's see. Tests show that you're running in AWS. Um, my data is sensitive and I can't have it sitting in a public cloud. Can this be run on-prem in my data center as well? Of course, it can be, you can run uh, the OpenShift uh, uh, cluster either on bare metal or on some uh, uh, on-prem uh, virtualized environment. And you can do uh, literally the same setup in terms of the OpenShift container storage, provide your bare metal devices uh, to the uh, OpenShift container storage uh, uh, pods. So you're only gonna get better performance. Well, I assume that's why that you're publishing the performance tests, otherwise we wouldn't publish them, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I haven't run OpenShift container storage before. Um, do I need to go to training or send my admins to training? Um, so what's yeah. the barrier to entry here? Well, I mean, I think that's one of the great things about deploying in the OpenShift environment. You know, the operators really streamline the day one, day two operations. Uh, and, you know, as you saw in the quote from Piotr, uh, you know, getting the environment up and running and performing to scale was very simple. You know, even for a team with no prior experience, uh, you know, of course, you know, Red Hat does offer services and expertise if you do need help, but, you know, getting up and running day one is, is pretty fast and easy. Um, and maybe, I don't know if Sagi or Yana have something to add to that, but uh, since they, they run the environment. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> I, I just want to say that the quote that you showed from uh, Piotr is actually um, when the DB2 slash CP4D team was doing their own initial testing and there was no actual involvement from Red Hat at that point. Mm -hmm. They basically installed their own OpenShift cluster and installed uh, OCS on their own. Um, and that's actually where the, the quote is coming from. So the environment that we tested on, um, you know, uh, obviously I know uh, what I'm doing, so I know how to install OCS, um, but the quote actually comes from a, a completely, you know, DB2 only separated uh, uh, team uh, 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 doing their own testing. Indiana? Yeah, I had made the same experience from what you were describing. I have not been on Reddit OCS before, but it was really easy to just get up and running. I, I mean, I, I asked probably a few questions, how do you do this and that here, but it was very simple overall. And we only had four days on the system, and I think we got more than done than what we expected we would be able to do in the time frame we had. Oh, I think originally we were planning to only do the one terabyte test, you know, but we were able in the end to, to add a complete different set as well. And, provide just some more data points that were relevant for, for the white paper. Are there plans to put a, kind of a configuration blog together or is there a configuration mm -hmm. guide that can just walk people through this or what are your thoughts? S specifically for this, uh, for a db 2 environment? Um, I mean, for OC, from OCS perspective, we are, um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, we are going to come up with some kind of a sizing configuration guide. Uh, um, and of course, when it comes to storage, things change and varies from the cloud or even any cloud provider and their own specific storage abilities and and then to uh, uh, the on-prem, whether it's bare metal or, or uh, virtualized. Um, so I do think we're going to come up with a, with a sizing guide um, to help people uh, uh, understand that. Yes, uh, I, I think that would be good for us to, to take a look at, you know, so we, we currently have uh, an internal sizing guide that's, you know, kind of based on capacity measures and how to, how to configure 
uh, the, the solution across different clusters, right? But uh, adding that perspective of, you know, what do you need for performance? What, do you, what are your performance expectations and how you can, should configure, what disk you should use, et cetera, et cetera, is, is helpful. Uh, I know that there's a knowledge base of deploying IBM DB2 on OpenShift. Uh, there's a knowledge base article around that uh, out there right now. Uh, I don't know that it really gets into the storage perspective on that. Um, perhaps the, the white paper will help with that, but uh, I agree with Siggy, we should probably look at uh, adding some, some more information into our OCS documentation as it pertains to sizing for performance. And do you have any final thoughts that you want people to, to really take away from this? You have your webinar that's coming up um, yeah. about, go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah, I just I wanted to mention there is a panel discussion with some of the IBM and Red Hat executives uh, that's scheduled for the 28th of July. Unfortunately, I don't have a link to that yet, but um, it, uh, I believe it's probably going to be posted out on uh, ibm.com slash events. Um, but uh, in, in any case, um, you know, if there's, uh, if there are questions around that, you can get back in touch with uh, any of us and we can give you some additional info.